Taking charge of your future starts with taking the first steps. And saving up to $30 a month on Cox Internet with the Affordable Connectivity Program makes those steps easy to take. Whether they bring you to click upload on your first short film or join now for an online book club. Applying is easy. See if you qualify at cox.com slash ACP. Non-transferable one per household application and eligibility decisions are made by the FCC. Hello and welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello everyone. My guest today is Tabitha Worsley, a young jockey who in April this year made the national headlines when she rode sub-lieutenant, a horse trained by her mum, in the Grand National. Thanks for joining me on the podcast, Tabitha. Nice to be here. Well, I finally tracked you down. You're, you're a very busy jockey. How are you and how is your season going so far? Yeah, it's been a brilliant start to the season, actually. Um, got eight winners on the board already, which is uh, actually level with my best season. So hopefully we can kick on and, and have a fair few more. Um, I did miss eight weeks for injury, but uh, it came in at the right time through the summer. So we don't mind too much. But uh, no, hopefully we'll, we'll keep kicking on and a few more winners. And it's been a busy month this month anyway. So um, yeah, keep yeah. kicking. Yeah, I know. I know it's been a busy month. I was going to ask you that later on. Um, and you're getting more rides, though. Yeah, um, it's been absolutely brilliant. Uh, my agent, uh, Russ James, has been absolutely brilliant in getting me on some nice horses for really nice people as well, which is always a good thing as well. They're just the quality is starting to get a bit better. Um, so hopefully we'll continue to, to follow that route. Yeah, and talking about the quality, you, you had a ride in the Paddy Power Gold Cup. Yeah, no, um, I was very, very lucky. Um, it was very unfortunate. James Davis was injured. Uh, which is how I managed to pick it up. Um, but Richard very put a lot of faith in me. And the horse ran a really, really good race. Um, slightly softer ground, I think you'd have seen him a bit closer. Um, it was a big ask for him. And he equipped himself very well. And as I say, he was only beaten about 25 lengths. Uh, but I'm just very grateful to be given an opportunity like that. It must have been a thrill riding in such a big race like that at Cheltenham with such a big crowd as well. Yeah, massively, and say it's just so nice to have the crowds back as well. Particularly somewhere like Cheltenham, where you've just got that atmosphere and that roar. It's um, it made you realise how much it was very quiet, and you missed the crowds through COVID. Well, thank you for that. We're now going to move on to your big day at Aintree in in April. Uh, how did that first come about? You come in to ride sub lieutenant in the race. Well, when we actually bought him, the plan was never to go for the national with him. Um, we bought him with the sort of view of going veterans chasing and taking that route, but he had a little setback and just missed the last qualifier. So we ran him in a listed race at Ascot and he, he ran a really good race to be fourth on real soft ground. And the more we looked at it, the more we thought, actually, this could be our one and only chance to ever have a runner in the national. Uh, so we then thought, actually, yeah, let's target that. So we waited we didn't actually run him in again until the national weights were out because uh, we knew off 146 we'd get a run, um, which thankfully <laughs> we scraped in at the bottom there and um, it was all rose to entry after that. And again, he ran a very nice race at Ascot en route there. Because we're talking about a, a top quality horse here. He was second in the, in the Topham, looked up second also in the Ryanair, fourth in the Ryanair in a, in a race where he beat Frode on, and I think it's Q Card's last race actually. So a very big horse for your mum's stable. Massively, yeah. So uh, biggest horse we've ever had. And I mean, we, we were kind of like, how do we train a horse like this? Because I mean, his last hard piece of work before he went to the National was with one of our mares that was rated 68. <laughs> um, so it was even finding the quality to work him with. But he always does enough at home and he, he's just a lovely horse to have about. And I think those older horses, you don't have to hammer them as hard because they've they know the job um, and they know sort of how to do it. And I think he enjoyed our way of training him. And we took him on lots of little days out and took him on big, long galloping hacks and just didn't hammer him. And I, th- I think he, he benefited from that because he is getting a bit older now. And both you and the horse had got experience of racing at Aintree. As I said, Sub-Lieutenant had been second in the Topham in 2019, the same year you won the Foxhunt is on your first ever ride round Aintree? 
Yeah, and Topwood was an absolute legend. Uh, he just took to the fences and uh, that was an unbelievable day. Um, I mean, you dream of things like that and turning in when I'm still swinging off him, you still think, oh, something's going to come and nab us. But he was unbelievable that day. And say so it was some training performance from Kelly. Again, the trust to put me on him. I'd only ridden him once before at Cheltenham when he finished third. So it was, again, a, a big a big faith from her. And thankfully, we managed to repay it and he won it very well. And back again to the National, it was a real family affair because both your brother and sister-in-law were leading the horse and, of course, your mum's training it as well. Yeah, he's uh, he's not the easiest in the paddock. <laughs> um, he's a little bit of a handful. Uh, he actually, between the paddock and the track, he managed to break three bits of railing because he just gets very excited. It's nothing more than excitability, but um, it took both of them to to keep him under control. And as much as Hector sort of complains about it, he wouldn't not do it. He, he loves being part of it. He <laughs> just makes a fuss sometimes, but it's just... It, more special being there as a family and doing it all together on a, a big day like that. But what was it like without any crowds there? We're all watching on the TV, but you know, you, you've got nobody there. What did that spoil the day a little bit? Um, I mean, it, it is noticeable that it's quiet, but I think for us, it was such a family thing that we were sort of, we had our six friends there that were owners but it was such a family affair that I think we still managed to have a, a really good day. I mean, it would have been amazing with crowds there as well, but it was still a very special day for us. And as for the race itself, uh, how did he take the fences and the, the, the 40 runners in a race? He loves it. He, he's such a professional. I mean, on the whole, you just leave him to it. He, he's got the experience around there and I learned very quickly on top with the the best thing you can do is let a horse just find the fence and, and don't be asking too much and they take to it or they don't. And I say I was lucky enough he'd been around before and he was very good. So I just got to sit and enjoy him and they went very, very fast, which you'd expect in a 40 runner handicap. Um, but he just kept plugging away and he just stays all day. He just probably doesn't have the gears that he would have had two years ago. And he got round, he came 14th of the 15 finishers. How did that feel smile. when you finished the Grand National? Oh, it's unbelievable to say. We always went there sort of hoping, first things first, safe round, get round complete, everyone back in one piece. And if we could then finish top half, we'd be over the moon. And he's done exactly that. So couldn't be happier. And what was it like being at uh, not only the Grand National, you know, one of the most famous race races in the world, but a day when the first ever Grand National where a female jockey and Rachel Blackmore uh, won the race on Manila Times. Yeah, again, unbelievable day. And I mean, Rachel, she's, anyone should follow Rachel's role in racing. She, she's unbelievable. She's just so down to earth. She's the ultimate professional and just the most unbelievable rider. And I say, if anyone is aspiring to be a jockey, look up to her. She does everything right. And she was one of the previous jockeys of Sub Lieutenant when, when he was at uh, Henry de Bromheads. Yeah, she rode him quite a lot. So I had a good chat with her um, at Cheltenham, actually, because I was riding out for de Bromheads through the festival last year. So I had a good chat with her a few times about him. And uh, she just said, you'll just have a lovely spin off him. He's an absolute legend. And is there any prospect of Sub Lieutenant running this year in the Grand National? No, he definitely won't be going back. Uh, not for the Grand National. He might go for a few more local nationals, but he won't be going for the big one again. But hopefully you will again one day. It would be nice. I'm, I'm not convinced it'll be on one train from home because I'm not sure my mother can put herself through that again. But uh, <laughs> we can dream. Well, let's take you back to your, your beginnings in horse racing, horse riding. When did your horse riding career begin? I've, I've been on a horse and riding since before I even remember. Um, my mum tells me that when I was about three, we had some liveries and I'd sort of stand outside the sand school with my hat and ask to ride their ponies back into the stables. And I just, I've always loved it. And the horses have always been a massive part of my life. And um, both my parents were masters hunting uh, growing up. So 
I did a lot on the hunting field, which I think massively taught me to ride because you end up just following into some big hedges and it teaches you to sit back a bit. Um, and I say it just, we did all the pony club and all of that, which sort of give us that real good grounding to it. And then eventually went on to pony racing, which again, from a racing perspective, is the best grounding you could ask for. And uh, we actually managed to do the 1-2 in the 2008 one three eight final up at Aintree. Uh, my brother won it and I came second, so it was a good day up at Aintree. <laughs> oh, so you were beaten by your brother on, on that day? I was. He likes to remind me on a regular occasion. <laughs> uh, and he beat you at Aintree as well. Yeah, which he kept telling me when we went to the National, he kept saying, just remember I've got 100% strike rate, right yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you... Then we went uh, point to point racing, and your, your first ride um, was in February 2011, and then your first winner was in April 2011. And then under rules, your first ride can you remember your first, first horse you rode at Folkestone in May 2012? Saddler's Blaze. <laughs> um, I, that was actually my brother's horse. Uh, I didn't particularly get on very well with him. I rode him a couple of times with very limited success. He was, I think, much preferred my brother and liked to let me know. But he gave me a lovely first spin under rules. I think it went downhill on him after that. But uh, my brother then reclaimed him, which was a much better option. And then your first win uh, came on the 24th of May 2015 at Fontwell. And you remember the the horse there? Yeah. You must remember your first winner, yeah. Our beloved house party. We've still got him. Uh, my sister-in-law actually has him now. She does a load of hunting with him and just absolutely adores him. Pony pats him all the time. So he's he's still in the family, as is my first point winner. He's out in the field, happily retired. So we uh, keep hold of them. <laughs> yeah, how many horses has your mum got in the stables? Uh, we've got 10 in stables at the minute, but we've got a few youngsters out in the field and I say a few of the old retired ones out in the field. Um, and then sort of a couple of them are out on loan, still having jobs and stuff. Uh, we don't really like selling them, particularly when they've been such good stalwarts for us. It's, it's very hard to, to part with them. We like them to come back in their old age and retire happily. Now, as I said earlier, it's been, uh, not easy tracking you down because you're such a, a busy jockey and you know? I, and I just want to talk to you about your life as a jockey. And um, we're, we're, we're getting towards the end of November. And I looked up that um, this was your program for um, a week in November. On the 9th, you were at Lingfield. The 10th, you were at Exeter. Then on the 11th, you went up to Market Raisin. Then you had two days at Cheltenham. And then, then the day after, you were at Fontwell. How do you cope with all the travelling? It's a lot, but I say when you when you're going somewhere for for nice rides and you're riding for nice people, it's it's well worth it. And thankfully, my car's very comfortable. Um, and it say it's I, I've come very accustomed to the driving, and you sort of get on and go now. But I mean, it is a lot, and it's it's rare at the minute that I do less than sort of fifteen hundred miles a week. But um, no, it's it's worth it generally. You must really love, um, if you can call it a job, because um, it's more like a vocation. Because, you know, however good a jockey you are, there's going to be more downs and ups. You're going to lose a lot more races than you're going to win. How do, you, how do jockeys deal with that sort of mentality, knowing that they're going to lose more races than win? It, it is a tough one to say, as you say, it is a sport that massively you're always going to lose a lot more. But... Um, I think I was very fortunate growing up that I played a lot of different sports and when you're playing team sports and stuff, you, you're never going to win every time. And I think from a young age, I learned to deal with good days and bad days. So I've sort of mm. become accustomed to it. And I just always think if you can try and pick the positives out of each ride, because to say some horses, they might be young horses that have finished fifth, but actually run really well and be a nice horse for the future or, they try and just pick the positives out of it obviously sometimes there aren't too many but um it's always looking to the bigger picture and hoping that each horse one day will fall right and will win a few races and then you get the good days 
So you're always learning with each each ride you have. Massively, yeah. You can never stop learning, and uh, you've got to keep learning. You, I go back and watch every ride I've had, watch the replay a couple of times, and if it's even if it's a winner, you go, "Oh, could I've done this better? Or I did that well. I could do that better next time." And I think you've got to be willing to to evaluate every performance and and learn from it going forward. And of course, we've got so many different types of courses as well massively i say they're all different and every horse is different every trainer is different and it's just trying to sort of accommodate each one and acclimatize and we're very fortunate nowadays that every race is recorded so we can go back and watch it and if you it's so easy to get hold of people so if you're sitting on something that you've never sat on before but other people have ridden it you can talk to them about it and you can you can pull bits of information from so many different places nowadays that I think it does massively help. Yeah, I don't suppose jockeys of you know of yesteryear had anything like the information that you've got available to you now. No, not at all. I say we're, we're very lucky in that respect. And how much time are you at the races before your say you, you're riding in the first race? How how long would you be before you got there at the start? I'll always try and allow to get there about two hours before so that you've got time to sort of go on the course or if it's been a long journey, you've got time to just sort of have a sit down and a cup of tea and just a bit of time to relax, uh, maybe read, read the racing post and just have a flick through the runners again and just time to then mentally prepare for, for the day ahead, really. And you mentioned earlier about injuries. Uh, you had quite a, a bad injury when you broke your back and you've got, I think, a metal rod and some pins in your back how do you deal with 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 injuries they're frustrating more than anything but um i i just work hard to get back as quick as we can and i think when you've got a target to get back for it's a lot easier um to do it and we're very very fortunate as jockeys that we've got the injured jockeys fund and i've spent a lot of time down at oaksey and they've just brilliant at rehabbing injuries and giving you the right advice and they'll, they'll really push you they'll push you hard but they know the limits and then um, they say they've they've been brilliant at getting me back from all my injuries in the shortest possible time but also safely and very strong and in national hunt racing in april last year tragedy struck with one of your friends lorna brooke um fell and then subsequently died after a fall at taunton how does did that affect you and and the and the uh, the weighing room? It, I mean, it sent shockwaves through the whole weighing room, and it it showed how much of a community the weighing room was. The way that everyone clubbed together and showed their respects towards Lorna, and it just showed how well respected she was amongst all her peers and how many sort of people she touched. And she she was just the most incredible person and one of the nicest people you will ever meet and the racing really came together in a in a tough time and they honored her very well and even taunton the tribute they did when they had racing back she'll live on forever and i mean fairy house they had a race in her memory the other day and i think people will always remember her for that and it it was tough it was very tough on all of us but she had wanted us to sort of keep going and and push on yeah, the Fairy House race the other day was commemorating a race she won herself at Fairy House. Yeah, I so say she went over there and then she went over and won again on the horse. And I was talking to one of the Irish girls the other day who was over and she rode in it and she said, I didn't know Lorna well, but a couple of times I met her, she just seemed like the bubbliest, nicest person. And that's exactly what she was. And in the summer, you were involved in some fundraising in memory of Lorna in, in Scotland. Yeah, we, um, <laughs> uh, stupidly, it wasn't stupidly because it was for a good cause, but um, I think we uh, we didn't realise quite how hilly <laughs> it was because none of us were cycling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think collectively the three of us had been on about 20 bike rides before we went, but when you're doing it for a good cause, that, that pushes you through and I'm not going to say we weren't cursing her up some of the hills, but she's also the reason that we we got it done and she was with us all the way helping us. 
And I think you were you were raising money for the injured jockeys fund and retraining of racehorses. Is that right? Yeah, two charities sort of very close to Lorna. Um, we joked about it because retraining racehorses, she was a massive part of that. But we also joked because she would quite often get these older horses and just keep running them like Spock. He was still running at 17. <laughs> so we didn't really call it retraining. But um, no, there were two charities that were very close to her. Well, thank you very much there for paying tribute to Lorna. I'm sure she was looking down on you when you were doing your going up those hills in Scotland. Probably laughing at us. <laughs> I can't believe that you didn't realise that Scotland was quite so hilly. I mean, I live here in the Fens and there's no hills here, but Scotland. Uh... We, we're we're going to pick Holland next year. Holland's flat. <laughs> now, I, I found out off air that you, you played uh, cricket when you were younger. And you, I know you've been listening to some of my podcasts and, uh, and you've liked some of the cricket ones. But what can you tell me about your, your cricketing skills? Yeah, I so, say uh, when I was at school, I was at uh, Brighton College who were brilliant for cricket. They were very good at getting all the girls going. And I started playing when I was uh, probably in year nine, so about 13, 14. Uh, played a bit of county cricket. Um, everyone always thought I'd be a good batter because I played a lot of hockey, but I was terrible. <laughs> I just tried to smash it out of the park every time and normally it resulted in middle stump out of the ground but bowled quite a bit and um, we used to play in the boys teams and it was just really good fun and I say I played a bit for Sussex and as I got a bit older I had a few injuries with shoulders and stuff through riding and it I slowly sort of started to play a little less cricket but I'd love to play the odd game now but it's just finding time. Yeah, well especially well you're not going to play in November anyway but uh, yeah, yeah. With, the, with the amount of uh, riding you're doing around the country. But you still follow yeah. cricket a little bit? Yeah, massively. I say I've well, watched every game of the T20 World Cup. I love watching the sort of the last and uh, the hundred last year. It's and even sitting down to watch a bit of Test match cricket sometimes as well. It's um, it's a sport I'll always follow closely. Oh, I'm good to hear that. I mean, the hundred was a massive um, boost to women's cricket, particularly. Mm, massively, yeah. No, I say, and I I still know a couple of the girls that are sort of playing from when I was at school as well. So it's Gives you that extra interest following them. And what about the future as a jockey for um, Tabitha Worsley? Just keep keep working hard, keep my head down and um, just keep trying to get on nice horses, try and kick in as many winners as we can and um, stay f- safe and sound more than anything. And sub-lieutenant for the rest of the season, has he got some races lined up? He's got a few in mind, but he needs some rain. Um, we won't run him now until the ground goes soft. But if it goes soft, I'd quite like to take him up to Kelso on the 5th and run him in the Borders National. Um, but I say it's, it's going to be weather dependent. He needs a bit of rain now. Well, I think everyone's looking for some rain. So uh, best of luck there. And thank you very much for, for coming on the paddock and the pavilion. I'm actually speaking to a guest who actually listens to some of the episodes. So do spread the word. And on that note, I did want to mention today that I'm, I've now got listeners in, in Russia. And I'd love to actually hear from the person who's listening to the show in Russia. So there's a shout out for you there if you can get in touch with me and let, let us know who you are and uh, either tweet or direct message me on, on Twitter. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Tabitha, for coming on the show. No, thank you for having me. It's been great to chat to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and now on Instagram at The Pad and Pad. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandsLots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. <laughs>